we've got this has been great and I, I'm loving it. We we have one one listener, Jody writes, I want post Mormons to realize this is not a typical experience with alcohol. What would you say to Jody? I'm curious why Jody feels like she needs to say that, first of all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Almost like she's saying, Hey, d don't 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 hesitate to try it because a lot of people have great experiences and yeah. And I, I'm just curious. I'd be curious why Jody feels the need to say that. But what would your response be to that? Um, I would just say, um, you know, all of our experiences are going to be different. You know, this is just my experience with it. You know, um, I think people can, and I know people who do like drink on occasion. They don't drink to excess. You know, and that's that is totally, you know, fine. You know, if, if you are comfortable with that in your life, the way that is, then great. You know, just the same thing with religion. You know, I don't put it on anybody to say, oh, you should or shouldn't believe this or that or go to this church or that church or whatever. Or you shouldn't do this or that, you know, um, you know, like occasionally I'll still like, you know, smoke some marijuana, you know, like it's, you know, that's, which is legal in Washington, which is legal in Washington. So, you know, but it's, it's like how, you know, if you've ever like questioned yourself on anything, then question it. If you're not questioning it and you don't feel like it's a problem, then it's, then it's not for you. So uh, that's, you know, I, I would say I'm glad I took that first drink because there's no way I would be here where I am today and the person that I've become. Okay. And, so do you feel you know, like, this experience is actually, and I, I think you've already said this, but I just want to repeat it. You're feeling yeah. more whole, more psychologically well, physically well than you've ever felt? Yes. And it was yes. this bad experience with alcohol mm -hmm. that helped you get to this healthier place. Yes. And wow. So you don't like regret the trying alcohol. No, I don't regret trying it. I do regret some choices I made and they were bad choices and I own that, you know, it's like, yes, I made some poor, poor decisions with drinking and I definitely drank to excess to a point, you know, and I'm not saying everyone drinks to excess. Like that's, that's, you know, something that, you know, that's for you to, to judge yourself, you know, whether you feel like you've done that or not. Um, you know, but, you know, yes, I took risky behaviors. Yes, I learned some pretty hard lessons. I've learned a lot about my relationship with my husband, you know, going through this process, like codependency, like things I was doing, not in a healthy way in my own relationship as well. So, you know, I think I've learned so many lessons along the way regarding drinking, you know, relationships, you know, friendships, you know, all these things have like, collectively as a whole been something that, you know, I'm going to take these lessons with me and take them forward. Um, you know, and, and, and for me, I just feel like, yes, I'm, I'm glad I took that first drink. You know, I'm not saying don't take that first drink, you know, that's really a very personal and individual decision to make. Um, you know, but for those who, you know, who have left the church and are finding themselves questioning it, concerned for a family member, spouse, partner, daughter, son, whatever it is, you know, there's, you know, there's a lot that goes into why people drink, you know, just beyond, you know, um, the faith crisis, you know, or the emotions that come with that. Um, but, you know, not everyone, you know, I know ex-Mormons who drink on occasion, and that's, you know, yeah, that's that's okay. I mean, if it works for them, and they don't feel like it's problematic in their life, you know, I will say that I didn't find it problematic in the beginning. But it developed into that, you know, given my own experience and situation. And not everyone's going to have that same experience and situation. So it's very individual, like, it's a snowball that I started off, you know, really small, and it just it tumbled because I was living this life of, not really knowing myself after this, you know, faith crisis, like kind of muddling through, you know, life, stress, job, you know, relationship, all this stuff. I just, you know, I didn't really feel like I had a good compass after, you know, a Mormon faith crisis on how I wanted to go about my life, you know, and what I wanted 
to have in it and what I didn't. So, you know, I was muddling through that. And some people might feel more secure in the life that they have than I felt at the time. So, and that's, that's just, you know, everyone's individual experience. So. Love yeah. it. Yeah. The way I like to think about it um, is that, okay, so Jody writes back, I realize this is her experience. I just think sometimes people get caught up in the fears or bad stories they hear. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to offend anyone. I think alcohol can be a part of a healthy life. That's all. Yes, it's all very personal. Yeah. So yeah. thanks, Jody, for the clarification. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, you know, it's tricky. This is how I see it. Yeah. And, and this may be a little bit controversial, but I see, and this is, you know, I, there's been drinking in my family. Drinking hasn't, uh, led to anything good in my family and I'm, I'm very happy and, uh, I have a lot at risk. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I'm a public figure. Right. Um, you know, we know about Brett Kavanaugh and kind of what things can happen at parties when people start drinking. I don't right. ever want to ever do anything that would ever come close uh, to being misunderstood or to being abusive or to violating anyone's boundaries. As a public figure, I just can't afford to ever not be in full control right. of the internet and everything and just because I don't want to hurt people. So there's right. that. There's the fact that there's a history in my family. There's the fact that I've in my family, uh, meaning my, you know, let's just say extended family, I've seen alcohol really wreck lives. Right. Um, you know, I'm happy for all those reasons. I don't need the calories. I don't, <laughs> and, yeah. um, I don't need it to have fun personally. I'm very extroverted. So I don't need a social lubricant to right. be around people. Right. Um, and I like to dispel the stereotypes that, and I like to sort of live by example that Mormons can, post-Mormons can keep the good of Mormonism. You don't have to throw out right. everything good in Mormonism to be a right. you know, post-Mormon. And, and exactly. frankly, I work with a lot of believers and I like to be able to tell them, yeah, I don't, I don't drink because that's something right. that see is scary. So for all those reasons, I don't drink. But to respond to, you know, um, to respond to Jody's point, I kind of have grown to see drugs and alcohol use kind of like playing Russian roulette with a chamber that let's just say yeah. has a hundred, you know, empty chambers and only one chamber with a bullet in it. And, and that's a, it's an extreme analogy because right. most people don't die, although some do. Let's say, uh, let's say Russian roulette with, a, you know, 10,000 chambers, um, but some will wound, you know, sometimes a bull will wound you and sometimes it will kill you. In other words, you're introducing risk into your life. There, it may not affect you at all. You may be a thousand percent fine. Right. You just happen to be one of those people, one in a hundred, one in a thousand, one in 500, right. where it will either damage you or wreck your yeah. life. Yeah. For me, but, I don't want to take that risk. Right. And, and, and everyone has to make that risk analysis for themselves when, right. when they, when they leave the church, you know, what, you know, I never really thought, you know, like when I started questioning the church that I would go down the road of, you know, drinking at all. Um, but I mean, I haven't beyond marijuana tried anything else, you know, I, I don't feel compelled to do that just because I'm like, you know, I have this probably irrational fear that, you know, I could have, you know, a bad reaction to something. And is it worth the risk, you know, and, and, and because, you know, alcohol is a very socially, culturally accepted, you know, thing to do, or substance to use, we categorize it differently than heroin or opiate, you know, opiates, other hard drugs, when in fact, it kills more than all the other drugs, you know, so it's, you know, alcohol related deaths is way higher than other substances. Um, yeah, like if you were going to compare marijuana, the dangerous yeah. risks of marijuana, right? To alcohol, it's not even close. Yeah, right? it is. Alcohol it, it's is not. Yeah, it, catastrophically alcohol. more damaging and dangerous. Right, and that's not to say, you know, and again, it's like, you know, when we when we think about it mentally in our heads, it's like. I was saying in the beginning, and this is something Annie Grace talks about in her book is like, you know, no one wakes up someday and says, I'm going to be an alcoholic today. No one wakes up and says, I'm going to, you know, be a heroin addict today or a meth addict or whatever. Like these people come into it from various backgrounds, very, you know, like, you know, trauma, you know, abuse, like these things, you know, 
there is some sort of like PTSD, you know, that occurs from leaving the church, you know, a sense of betrayal, depression, anxiety, and, and we fall into, you know, if we introduce, you know, substances to us, you know, um, along the way, sometimes it can hijack us, you know, like from, from really, you know, dealing with emotions and, and things like that. And that isn't everyone's experience, but it is a risk. I mean, it, it is a very real risk and I have experienced the real risk, you know, of maybe getting caught with a DUI, you know, or it wrecking my marriage, you know, and I, you know, and I was sitting there like trying to slam the brakes on, but it was this, you know, when I thought I had control, I really didn't because when I tried to put the brakes on it, it was a struggle. Like the brakes should not be that hard if I don't have a problem. Right. You know, <laughs> like, you know, it's, it. It, you know, and that's my experience. And, and it is, it is a risk you take. And so, you know, for me, I just, you know, living through the experience of these past, you know, six and a half years, I guess that I was actually drinking, you know, the risk just outweighed the benefits in my life, you know, and yeah, that's and what I, it comes and, down to. And in the, you know, it's like, sit down, make a list. What is it giving me? What is it taking away? You know, I'm like, you know, I'm a nurse, like, I should know, you know, like, this is not healthy, you know, people, you know, it increases your risk of cancer, it, you know, increases, you know, the risk that you pass on these, you know, habits to your children, you don't think that you're doing it. But, you know, when I would sit there with a beer or a glass of wine, and my child is seeing me as an adult, having a good time, and I say, no, this is an adult drink, you know, like, they are making the association that to be an adult, to be having a good time, a drink has to be in hand, you know, like, you know, I realized, oh, my God, what have I been doing, you know, in front of my kids, totally not intentionally, but I am sending these like, little messages to them, you know, that this is how, you know, this is how adults behave and this is how adults act, you know, and it's with booze in hand. And, you know, there was a point in time where it was like, well, what would we do? You know, when we were really in the throes of our drinking, you know, like, would we let our kids try it before they're of legal age, you know? And my husband was like, sure, why not? As long as it's at home and controlled, you know, and I was like, what? <laughs> like, why would we do that? You know, it's not legal, you know? So, I mean, all these like questions, you know, start popping up in my own mind, you know, like what message am I sending my kids? Do I want what I've been through for them? You know, like, I don't know. Like I, I really started to, to think, you know, do I want to even introduce that risk to my children? You know, like, for me, it just, the answer became a no. And so it wasn't a risk I was willing to take. And I have been open to my kids and they are 11, almost nine and six. And my daughter who's nine, you know, I've said, you know, I don't drink because it's not good for me, you know? And, you know, I will say like after stopping drinking, I had a lot of anxiety about telling friends that I don't drink anymore. I mean, I'm not out there advertising it, but if they offer me something, I say, no, I, I decided to, you know, stop drinking. And if they ask why, then I will tell them my story, you know, and, and go into it. But, um, you know, it, but it did create some, you know, anxiety of like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to have like my, my safety net, you know, alcohol to, to feel like I'm part of the crowd or that I have my social lubricant because I am more introverted, um, or have been, my husband kind of extroverted my introvertedness <laughs> over the years. But, right. um, you know, there was some nervousness about going back out into the world without that cup in hand. Right. So or bottle or whatever. So we have a bunch of great comments from our listeners. I'm just going to read a bunch and, sure. and we'll talk about each one. Is that okay? Sure. So Marie DeMarco writes, I just want to mention also that as drinking is in the Australian culture, it's used to party or during meals, not so much as a boost for sad feelings. Here in Utah, I found alcohol drinkers to be very different. So what, what many are talking about is the function of the drinking. If you drink to be social, just to have a good time. That's very different than drinking to numb your feelings is number one is that, I mean, I think we've already said that's, that's yeah. true, but also that doesn't it, mean there's not risk, right? There's still right. risk. 
Right. Well, and I would have to say that, you know, at first for me, it started out as a social thing. Like, yeah, like you have a glass of wine at dinner with your friends and, you know, or we, we get together for a barbecue and you have a beer or two. It was very social, but, you know, I, and I guess this might be, you know, that spectrum or an example of the spectrum for me, like it, there was no draw to drink by myself at home, like at night, you know, like after work or if my husband was out of town or whatever, I think I maybe had a beer by myself a handful of times, you know, but for someone who may have a history of trauma is, you know, on, on the spectrum of probably having more enhanced dopamine receptor sites, um, genetically or whatever, um, you know, or is it has fallen into using it as a way to cope, to relax, to deal with stress, you know, like, you know, my husband would open a beer or two at home. Like, I mean, I work night shift. So, you know, we eventually switched to 12 hour shifts. He puts the kids to bed. He says, I've worked hard today. I deserve it. I need to relax and drink, you know? And then it was like, you know, I'm feeling kind of down. I need kind of that little buzz. You know, we, we, we don't always realize these little subtleties that change along the way. So, you know, and, and I think different countries probably have different cultural attitudes towards drinking. I think Western culture, you know, I mean, I think of, you know, the Super Bowl. how many beer ads do you see during the Super Bowl? Or, you know, where do you see, you know, I walk into Target and wine bottle pictures are at the bottom of my basket, you know, like, they're serving wine at Target now in some places, you know, while you shop. And I'm just like, this is insanity, you know, just like day drinking, you know, those sorts of things, you know, by the time you've started day drinking, if you start at noon, you've got to drink every hour to keep that up into the evening, you know, and, you know, you're six or seven drinks in, you know, I never thought I'd ever have more than five drinks in a night. And I did, you know, that's not something I, right. So for some, it's a slippery slope for others. It's not for some it is. Yeah. And I think that's just, it really is person dependent. It's history dependent. It's coping mechanism dependent. You know, it's, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of factors that go into it, but I think more importantly, is it a problem? Is it causing relationship problems, job problems? You know, I think those things are, you know, if you've ever questioned it, open up that book and, you know, say, well, why am I questioning that? Just like we did with the church, you know, right. Um, you know, it's, it's something to look into. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see Uh, others. Some are, some are responding to my, my, uh, venting session about why post Mormons always has to have to ask me why I don't drink. Courtney writes, I haven't experienced that at all. That seems like it's a friend thing. I hang out with people and don't drink and no one says a word. Well, we don't hang out at the same (laughs) place as Courtney. Or maybe it's because I'm a public figure. People feel really invested in what I do. Um, But anyway, Jody writes, I think people who have never been Mormon don't care if you drink or not. People don't consume alcohol for a lot of reasons. Maybe the peer pressure John is explaining comes from people's own insecurities. And that's what you thought. Yeah. 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 Insecurities definitely play a role. You know, like, you know, if we've always felt a little socially awkward and have found alcohol to take away that feeling of awkwardness, you know, it definitely, you know, alleviates that, that social anxiety, I guess. Um, uh, you know, and I think, I mean, at least in my, you know, experience, it's been, you know, I, I mean, the neighbors that we drank with did not, they were not of Mormon faith origin, I guess, you know, some of them had a Christian background of sorts, but had since left their own Christian faith, Um, you know, and I guess, you know, everyone's experience is is just going to be different and and, in how people deal with you not drinking socially or you not, I mean, a lot of people who know Mormonism from a distance probably are like, oh, I had this Mormon friend and they didn't drink. And well, you left Mormonism, so now you should, right? You know, because, you know, they just don't have the context, I guess, to really understand, you know, the variety of experiences post-Mormon. You know, not many people know Mormons who've left the church. We're still a a breed that's out there, you know, and if we're not vocal about it, they don't know. 
So Lisa writes, I have siblings who left the church and turned alcohol. It is hard for me to see in their homes, but I told myself not to judge and to accept what brings them comfort in life. But I see the same judgment as I have not tried alcohol, but I'm one of those people who want to be in control of my situation. And I find I gain more strength by feeling my feelings and understanding them more. So yeah. Lisa, obviously we celebrate and support your decision not to drink. Absolutely. And we want to make sure everybody understand we celebrate your decision to drink. This is not an anti-drinking right. episode. It's just an educational episode, a vulnerable episode. Uh, right. Let's talk about it episode. Yeah. And everybody's got to make the decision that's right for them. Yes. Um, Jody writes, sipping one drink over time, having food with it, and not driving until it is metabolized is responsible adult drinking. Being drunk at a kid's birthday party sounds like another story. So absolutely. I mean, I think there's there's different levels, you right. I mean, there's like zero to sixty. There's, you know, I mean, in my experience, it was like when we first started drinking, okay, we're gonna have like a glass of wine at dinner, you know, that's yeah. great. You know, and it started, you know, with that. Again, for for us, it turned into something more, and that's you know, not something that everyone experiences, um, for sure. I will, um, I'll say, yeah, it's, it's definitely not everyone's experience, but. So you've already explained this, but Courtney writes, this isn't a judgment at all, but I just don't understand how people get so drunk. I know that when I have two <laughs> glasses of wine, I am done. I don't keep drinking. How do you get past that point? Is it a self-control issue? I'm just trying mm -hmm. to learn here. So she's basically yeah. saying, you guys just lack self-control. What's going on, Brittany? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, we all lack self-control on some level or another, whether it's food, drink, whatever. Like, yeah. I don't know about, court or, <laughs> you know, me and chocolate or me and a pint of ice cream. But, um, <laughs> you know, we all, you know, have to find what level of something works for us. Yeah. Um, I can tell you, I have a bad sugar habit, you know, like I have a sweet tooth, like none other, mm -hmm. um, you know, and you know, it's, it's, it's a comforting thing, right? You know, it's like, I'm doing this because it makes me feel good, you know, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, getting drunk was not something I ever said, I'm going to enter this drinking session with my friends and I'm going to get plastered. Right. Um, I guess there was probably maybe a few situations where it was like, Oh, me and one of my neighbor girlfriends, we went down to Seattle let's and go got get a hotel drunk. and it wasn't an intentional, like, let's go get drunk. But the night, the social night was, we started off with some champagne at the hotel. Then we went and had dinner, you know, walked downtown Seattle went and had dinner shared a bottle of wine there. Then we went back to the hotel and went to the bar, you know, had a couple lemon drop martinis and oh my gosh, like I felt like shit, you know, that wasn't my intention, but it was just like, you know, when you're drinking and you're drinking, you know, and that's the social thing you're doing and you've got all this time ahead of you, you know, like, I chug stuff. That's my tendency. I'm not a sipper. <laughs> so, Me either. Um, Me either. When I've drank coffee, I can yeah. drink a large coffee in like 30 seconds. Oh, me too. And my heart tells me you probably shouldn't do that. But, you know, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't like this intentional thing. And then the next morning, this was the first time I ever puked was like, I was definitely hung over in the morning. And, you know, for me, I just remember like, you know, when I've, was coming out of the church and I didn't have a lot of friends in this new place. You know, I mean, I grew up here, but I didn't have friends here anymore. Um, but you know, I had this new friend and we drink together and we had this good time together and I felt accepted and I felt loved, you know, and, and, and that all coincided together, you know, with drinking, but, um, you know, I, you know, getting drunk was never something I was like, I'm going to go do this. Like, I want to get drunk. It was something, you know, over time I was like, I'm never doing that again. But, you know, maybe six months later, I would drink to excess, um, given the social situation or, you know, the social climate that I was in at the time. Um, but, you know, since then, you know, since I've been sober, like I've been able to go out and have a good time with friends who are drinking. And, you know, I, you know, I make a point of it not to, you know, make it a thing to talk about. It's not like I want this to be like 
uh, you know, right. like Brittany's sober and look at her and, you know, like, you know, yeah. look at how great my life is. I just want to live my life fully. And that happens to be in a sober way. And you want to help so, other people. And I want to help struggling. other people. Yeah. And there are people struggling. Like for those Absolutely. of you who are like, I don't get it. I drink and I'm in control. I'll just tell you, I, I, some of my most heartbreaking moments of over the past 14 years are friends of mine, post Mormons who have left the church and had it come close to yeah. ruining their lives. And it happens. So yeah, we got to I mean, talk about it. Yeah. And, and that's not everybody. And um, right. that's not to say that those people went into drinking with the intention of it becoming that for themselves. It's, you know, it, is it a lack of self-control? I mean, the argument in alcoholism is that it's not the alcohol literally has the control. Um, you know, it's not a matter of willpower. Um, and there is an element of that, but it is not the entire solution to the equation, you know? So, I mean, right. it, it's, it's, yeah. it's a player, you know, I feel like I've got a lot of self-control and, and I really do. I mean, I'm, I'm a very disciplined person. I was disciplined through school, through my job. You know, I, I pride myself on my self-discipline. Well, I mean, you were but a when Mormon it came girl. to alcohol. You yeah. Were, you were a Mormon girl for 30 years. You didn't have premarital sex yeah. or try yeah. alcohol. Like, I think you had some self-control. I had some self-control. <laughs> but man, I sure as hell did not have control over the alcohol when it came to me really wanting to stop. Like, yeah. I mean, yep. it was, it took more than that. Yeah. So, and, and I think that's, you know, an, a, the flip side of it. Okay. You know, like how hard is it to stop? Can you go 30 days? Can you go six months? Can you go a year? You know, like, can you, you know, completely drop it cold Turkey? Some people, maybe that's the case. Most people who are excess, you know, extensively into a habit, habit of drinking, you know, people think, oh, you process it, it's out of your body. Alcohol actually, you know, stays in your body up to 10 days. I did not know this, you know. Mm -hmm. So if you're drinking every other night or, you know, every four or five days having a couple drinks, you know, it's gonna take time for that to get out of your system. So you may not be feeling the buzz and the high of it, but your body is still metabolizing it. So, you know, I think there's a lot of, you know, misconceptions about how alcohol actually acts on the body, um, you know, how it impacts your health. You know, I think again, knowledge is power and right. you know, self-control, yeah, that's a part of it, but it takes more than that to yep. to yeah, just overcome an addictive sure. substance. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'll read some more of these comments. Yeah. Uh, Lisa writes, I know people who drink to cover their pain in reality. It almost killed someone close to me. So that's someone saying it definitely can be a problem. Yeah. Marie writes, Lisa, that can be the case. But these people who drink too much are people who can't control their impulses, who also struggle with addiction. These people are prone to alcoholism. I think we've made that point right. um, as well. Uh, yeah. let's see. Um, Lisa writes, alcohol has caused generations of pain and anger in my family history. It yeah. has come down the line through time. I'm trying to understand the need for drinking and educate myself as to why people need it. From my perspective, yeah. it ruins families and family relationships. And that's Lisa's experience. Yeah. That's frankly my experience. Um, right. And that can be a huge deterrent for people who, you know, leave the church and it's like, okay, this is an option to try it, but what I given what I know what it's done to my family, you know, so I think that can be a huge deterrent if you know people whose lives it has really wrecked right. um, and destroyed, or if you've lost mm. someone, say to a drunk driver or, you know, whatever, like there's a lot of a reason not to, um, you know, at the time we left the church, it was like, well, we've been told no, 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 our entire lives. I just had to go on my own personal journey about why that was, you know, and I wanted to figure it out for myself. Um, you know, whether, you know, I didn't, I guess at the time I didn't really have that idea. I want to figure this out for myself. I was just like, okay, I have this freedom to experiment a little bit with life. You know, I never really experimented, you know, with anything as a youth. And so we were kind of reliving these years of, you know, a little bit of rebellious experimentation, I guess. Um, and, and it, and it spun out of control faster than we could keep up with it. So, um, you know, that's, 
but I'm, I'm again, I'm glad that I, that I, you know, had that experience. I personally have not lost people close to me with, you know, from drinking, but I've certainly seen the impact of it on people's lives now that I've stepped outside of it. Totally. And, and again, I don't want people to think this is an anti-alcohol episode. It's really not, but there is a famous study called the Harvard men's study. I think it's called, Mm -hmm. it's this longitudinal study where they studied men over many, many, many years, decades yes. in, in this cohort. Yes. And my understanding is, and this is, this comes, I've, I've read it, it's been a long time. Yeah. My understanding is, you know, it's hard to sort of, on a massive longitudinal study that's trying to look at overall health and well being, to right. ever really find any variables that are really solid. Stand out, yeah. Kind of, problematic. And my understanding from this Harvard men's study is that one of the clear outcomes was that alcohol use was, was a clear, uh, you know, negative sort of like correlate with long-term health and well-being um, in the Harvard men's study. And again, that's Harvard university. uh, And and you guys can check out, just Google Harvard, Harvard men's study. But I, yeah. I'm, I'm just going to read a few statistics yeah. from, from Harvard. Uh, alcohol use was the seventh leading cause of death and disability worldwide in 2016. 2% of female deaths and 7% of male deaths were considered alcohol-related. That's massive. Mm-hmm. For those ages 15 to 49, alcohol was the leading risk factor for death and disability worldwide. Tuberculosis, road injuries, and self-harm were the top, were the top causes. Um, so this says the risk of each of these conditions is higher if you drink enough. Okay. Right. For older adults, cancers related to alcohol use were the top causes of death. So when we look at the, the escalating instances of cancer death, like you mentioned earlier, I think, Brittany, right. yeah. alcohol is correlated with cancer. Is that right? That's correct. And then in the general health. I think 15% in women, the risk for cancer. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, that's not a risk I want either. I don't want to just live my life to be sick at the very end. You know, I want to be healthy along the way. And then it says in general, health risks rose with rising amounts of alcohol use. However, some protective effect related to light drinking less than one drink a day was observed for heart disease and diabetes in some groups. Okay. And that's always, that's always confusing because you see these reports coming out. A a drink, a, a glass of wine a day is actually good for your heart health, right? Right. I think what's important is to look at the source, you know, of these, these articles that come out. Cause I, I used to see them fly by on my Facebook feed pretty frequently, you know, um, you know, studies that would claim, you know, well, you know, the antioxidants of red wine, you know, but you know, all the same time, it's like, okay, so you have the antioxidants there and you just look at the one substance there, like, oh, it's got these good antioxidants. So therefore I can drink you know, the alcohol that then turns into acetylhyde, which is actually a poison to my body, you know, so it's like, I don't know, (laughs) weigh it out, you know, is it what, what, at what benefit, you know, are you willing to take the associated risk? Right. Yeah, Yeah. that's good. I I, I mean, I can probably get my antioxidants from, you know, pomegranate juice and be just fine. So, (laughs) you know, um, I think you just have to weigh it out and just make that decision for yourself. And and that's what I'm a huge proponent of is, you know, do what works for you. If it's working great, if it's not, maybe look into it. So, yeah, yeah. but yeah, the statistics, you know, are, you know, again, learning and absorbing information and really learning about what is driving my own behaviors, you know, along the way, you know, really became essential. Like, I think it's good to question why you do what you do, why you believe what you believe, you know, those things are important along the spectrum of life to be continually and actively engaging in, you know, like, is this working for me? Like, you know, I feel like super duped by, you know, the, the allure and the, the illusion of um, sophistication of, you know, um, class of whatever, you know, like, like all this glamour that is surrounded by alcohol. It's very, you know, it's very much like a moth to the flame. Um, You know, it's, it's very attractive and, you know, for some people it's attractive for some it's not and that won't be you know everyone's experience but 
um, you know, for me, it was like, yeah, I felt, you know, a lot of feelings I, I wanted to feel when I drank, you know, like I wanted to feel these things, but you know, at the end of the day, they were just this illusion that had been created around it. Right. And I believed the advertising, you know, they were selling me, you know, acceptance. And, you know, I've, I've listened to so many stories where they talk about alcohol being this warm hug or a constant friend, you know, alcohol doesn't judge you, you know, it's, and it makes you feel good. So, you know, for a period, but, um, you know, and then another thing is like, as your body is introduced to it, you know, it releases chemicals in your body expecting you to drink like you normally drink. And this is how tolerance is built up. And I noticed for myself, it took a little bit more over time to, to really get the effect I was looking for, you know, in a social situation or to feel that buzz again. So, you know, that's something to, you know, question too, am I drinking more than I was, you know, like, am I drinking? Um, am I right. having to drink more to, to get the response I'm looking for in my body? Right, you right. know, so it, it, all these things play a factor in, in what you should, you know, probably right. be questioning. Um, and if it's not a problem, then don't question it. But right. Yeah. Lori writes this, there's a huge opioid problem in our country. There are many members using these many Mormons using these drugs, thinking they're justified due to it being originally prescribed and I'll, I'll add yeah. parenthetically, and it's not prohibited in the word of wisdom to take opioids, right? Right. But then begin seeking other sources to continue those drugs. It's right. much easier to hide this, meaning the opioids, than alcohol. Uh, you don't get asked about that in your Temple Recommend interview, right? Do you take opioids? Or do you excessively eat sugar, you know? Right. Or sugar, or <laughs> yeah. caffeine, or yeah. what, cold, you know, diet, yeah. diet cola, whatever it is. Right, right, right. right. Anyway, it's not explicitly named, right? It's okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so she says it's much easier to hide this than alcohol. It's much easier to judge someone with a drink in their hand. That's a right. good point. There are a yeah, lot of ways people yeah. self-medicate, right? Uh, many ways. And I think, yeah. you know, when we're self-medicating, I think it's important to, you know, recognize that when we're self-medicating, I think deep down we know it. And um, there's a lot of shame and guilt probably associated along with it, um, you know, and those, those things need to be addressed, you know, at some point down the road. And you don't want to hit rock bottom before you address those things. Right. And, and that's really when, you know, they say in a couple of these podcasts, they'll use the phrase, play the tape forward. You know, like, where is this going? You know, whether it's your night of drinking or your night out with friends, like where play the tape forward. What does this, what does this look like going forward? You know, if you find yourself, you know, using more, drinking more, you know, finding that you're avoiding, you know, certain situations because you know, you either can't drink or, you know, would rather be somewhere else, you know, if you're avoiding family relationships because of it, you know, I think that's all, you know, these signals of like, maybe we should start looking into this a little bit, Right. you know, I, I think it's, you know, it's telling, but, and yep. some of us are willing to address it and some, you know, I lived in denial for a while that it was a problem. So, yeah. And sometimes you have to hit rock bottom, right? Yeah. Yeah. Luckily I don't feel, you know, I think my realization that I, you know, felt a little buzzed at work was a bit of a eye awakening moment for myself and, um, realizing what, um, damage it was creating in my marriage. So Jody writes the moral free fall that people experience after leaving the church is dangerous, especially when we are adults, parents, and professionals. I feel like I see this a lot in post Mormon forums. And that's true. There are all these holes, we've already talked about this, that develop when you leave the church. Identity, morality, spirituality, right. community, friendships, existential concerns. Right. And if you don't, you know, family issues, social yeah. issues, if you don't replace the holes that are left um, yeah. it, when you leave the church, then you're going to have these big gaping holes that cause you distress. Right. And that's why we did Gift to the Mormon Faith Crisis podcast. If any of you are going through yeah. a faith crisis, go to mormonfaithcrisis.com. We've got now 60 plus hours of free therapy. That's awesome. You know, you, you don't need to pay for a coach or therapist. Go to mormonfaithcrisis.com, download the episodes. And we've got, again, 60 plus hours of content that can help you 
avoid yeah. a lot of the pitfalls that lead to some of this behavior. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think leaving the church is very traumatic. Um, you know, those family relationships can be very strained. Um, you know, definitely uh, trauma is a huge player. And I think, you know, you go through this grieving process of like, I was grieving the life that I thought I was going to have. I was grieving, you know, this identity that I used to have. I didn't know who I was without the church in my life because it was such a part of it. So, you know, like all those, those, those steps and stages of grieving, you know, like definitely make you more vulnerable to, you know, things that you didn't quite see coming, you know, so. Totally. Victoria so. writes, she's from, she's one of our top fans from the UK. She writes, awesome. Brittany is very courageous for talking about this. So, so well, thank you. So Victoria is saying, thank you, Brittany. Well, thank you. Lisa Victoria, writes, I appreciate it. Yeah. Lisa writes, I think if the church, the Mormon church, was a place where people could be open and honest and truly talk about issues we all face, there would be more ways known of how to cope or to know you're not alone. And that's probably true just across society. Anything that's stigmatized and looked down upon, who right. we don't talk about, right? Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I would say, you know, definitely heavy drinking or excessive drinking or being an alcoholic or having mental health issues, you know, um, you know, being a marginalized, you know, group of people, you know, all those things are, you know, um, they're, they're, they're difficult. Um, so, so definitely, you know, being open to talking about that, having conversations about that stuff, connecting with people, we all want to feel connected. Um, you know, I, I really wish there had been a space, you know, for me in the church to be able to view my concerns and view my, you know, um, struggles in an open and accepting way, but I just never found it. Like I felt, I found that I was an outsider. I felt like I was the outlier person who didn't belong anymore and that I was um, a threat, you know, to, to the collective belief system or ideal, you know, um, environment that they were trying to foster and create, especially working with the youth, you know, like, I was this huge threat that was questioning the modesty culture, you know, like all these, you know, women's place in the church, you know, and so, you know, I was definitely, you know, rejected on those, on those levels. And there was no safe space for me to talk about it, except in, you know, Mormon stories, Facebook groups or other support groups and stuff like that, you know, and, and mental health, you know, is such a stigmatized area. Addiction is very stigmatized, you know, but I think, you know, the more we open up and talk about these, you know, things that are happening that, you know, are, are harder to talk about to, because it does create vulnerability. It does create a sense of like, oh my gosh, what are people going to think of me? You have, you're opening yourself to judgment and um, criticism and that, that sort of thing. And, you know, I, I just learned through the years, you know, I, I just had to stop caring what people thought of me. I had to be good with myself, um, you know, and, and, and I do open up and talk to people about, you know, my experience, you know, leaving the church. I talk to coworkers about it. We talk about it openly and freely, not in a judgmental way, but as a we're all in this life fumbling around in this human experience and, and it's all going to be very different from each other. But, you know, the fact that we even talked about it and brings us closer together, you know, our struggles, you know, uh, when you show vulnerability, um, you know, which I've tried to practice more, um, have actually brought me really amazing close relationships with people. And I really enjoy that. So um, I, I often, yeah. I, I totally agree. I often like to say that silence is so often the killer, right? It's, yes, yes, it, it really is our inability to talk about hard stuff that enables yeah. abuse, sexual abuse, physical absolutely. abuse, depression, mental health, suicide, alcoholism, addiction, you know, pick your thing, right? It, right. If we just could get better about being vulnerable and talking right. openly about things, uh, that would that would, would help. Be a better place. So many <laughs> yeah. Ways. yeah. Yeah. I Cheryl, agree. we love Cheryl Robinson. She writes, "This is such a good podcast episode, John. I've seen what she is saying happen with so many Mormons aren't prepared or educated about alcohol. Very mm -hmm. courageous of Brittany sharing her story, and she is so wise." 
Oh, well, what do you think about you. that? Wow, thank you. I'm, I, I, I hope I've gained some nuggets of wisdom along the way, and I, I'm glad that they're they're seen as such. Um, you know, it's very humbling to be called wise. Um, I just am a person experiencing life and trying to roll with it. So just yeah. take it. You're wise. Just take it. Thank you. Thank you. Big, Victoria writes, I'm with you, John. I don't drink alcohol either, and I'm very happy without it. I yeah. used to occasionally drink before I joined the church and stopped before I even investigated the church. I still haven't drank it since I left, and I'm not interested in alcohol. I'm totally fine with other people drinking. It's just not for me. Thank you for sharing that, v yeah, Victoria. And we have several listeners that write, I love alcohol. I I drink it occasionally. I don't yeah. drink to excess. It works for me. I really love it. Blah, blah, blah. And we celebrate you guys, right? Yep. Yep. Like I said, I mean, I, I enjoyed it in occasionally for a short period of time before, you know, I went on my own path, you know, and everyone's got their own. So I celebrate those who feel like it, you know, enhances, you know, uh, something in their life and, and, that's, that's totally great. So, yeah. so this is sort of bizarre. One of my former missionary companions from Guatemala is writing in. Oh, Jorge hey, nice. it's step uh, elder. Oh. It's step. He oh. writes, I really appreciate Brittany for sharing your story. I identify with her story. Drinking can be fun at first. And for most people, it will stay like that. But for others, it can be the beginning of something painful. Alcohol yeah. can bring out some ugly sides of people. I had my first alcohol in my late twenties and it was something, it was something fun for a while. But later on in my 40s, it became a problem. I had a DUI two years ago, and it was very expensive and painful in many ways. I'm still struggling with it, but I'm at a point where I realize it's a problem for me. Good job, Jorge, Elder Itzep. Yeah, I think most non-religious people experience this in their early 20s and Gosh, then realize yeah. that it's not for them and move on to live a good life. But for some people who experience this in their 40s, it's a different story. Bottom yeah. line is, if you don't need it, don't even try it, whether uh, for religious reasons or not. Wow. Th thank you, Elder Itzep. Yeah, thank That's you. That's powerful. That is powerful. And, you know, um, you know, I also just want to tell him, you know, there, there is hope out there. There are resources. Again, I found This Naked Mind to be a life-changing book for me um, and her podcast and some other podcasts out there, Recovery Elevator. Um, you know, just there, there are so, so many people out there in this like sober movement that is starting to brew. Um, you know, that I think it's, you know, everyone's out there trying to live their best life. And sometimes we think we're living our best life. And, and then, you know, some things happen that bring some of the more difficult and harder, darker parts of ourselves that maybe make us realize that a change needs to happen. And, and so, you know, take that first step, you know, you know, take that first day, don't drink or, you know, whatever it is, you know, there's a thousand day ones for some people, you know, going forward and, and that's okay. You know, like just being aware and conscious of, you know, what sort of path you want to be on with it, you know, is a, is a place to start. So, right. um, that's, that's, um, very awesome of him to share that, um, that experience. Neenan writes something that I hear a lot. You know, you always hear this thing about like, oh, in Italian culture, kids are taught responsible drinking from very young age. Yeah. And then they don't, they have a lower instances of alcoholism in places like Italy, where they drink a lot of wine, just because right. they're taught from a young age moderation. But right. Neenan writes, we need to be willing to teach our kids about moderation and be able to drink responsibly. I grew up with wine in our dinner table. We weren't allowed to have a glass until we were 16. And then only one with dinner, we right. had the constant examples of being responsible, of responsible drinking. Is there something right. to that, Brittany, you think? Um, I think, you know, there, there definitely is. Um, I've heard that same thing for um, the German culture as well. Um, you know, I think, you know, they say drink responsibly, you know, what does that look like? You know, what, what does that mean? Um, and I think it might have different meaning for different people and different cultures for sure. So, you know, I'm not here to say that one culture has it right or wrong or whatever. Um, again, I think, you know, I think you just have to ask yourself questions, you know, like, is this working for me? Do right. I feel yeah. like it's a problem? So, yep. you know, and for some people, they may never have to ask that question because of the example that they've been shown their whole life about 
how to use it responsibly according to that culture. And, so, and I'm and I'm sure yeah. there is alcoholism in Germany and Italy. You know. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So yeah, for sure. we don't want to get too romantic about any culture, right? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Courtney think- Hill Edwards writes: Alcohol damages your gut microbiome. Well, we we love you, Courtney. So we're glad that you shared with us that gut health is a big thing. So you know, and it deprives you. Excessive drinking will deprive you of essential vitamins and those sorts of things too. So I think you know whatever decisions you need to make that make you the healthiest person you can be then make those decisions marie writes too much sugar isn't good for you your health either absolutely absolutely not (laughs) no that's that's probably the one that we get away with the most you know in this country (laughs) so yeah um, and then neenan writes nothing is wrong with being thoughtful about personal health and wellness no. It's about so much more than alcohol. You may not drink, but choose to drink large amounts of Dr. Pepper and monster drinks. <laughs> Maybe eat cheeseburgers every day. Don't trade one unhealthy thing for another. Yeah, there is that whole like, uh, there, there's a term for it where you transpose one addiction into another. Um, I forget the name of the term. because I'm really bad. Conversion. I'm guessing it's conversion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So or at least so, that's the psychological term you right right so you turn one addiction to another so whether it's alcohol to sugar or you know excessive eating to excessive sex you know or what you know whatever brings the body pleasure like we're going to seek those things out so i think you know just you know moderation in all things healthy balance in all things you know mind spirit um, emotion all those things are just important to be aware of when we're doing anything that we think might be excessive. Um, so yeah. it's, it can, it can cross over to, you know, excessive exercise is a thing too. You know, yep. you get those endorphins from exercise and, and that can be, you know, you can be seeking out that runner's high every time you go running, you know, and that's not a bad thing. Excessive work, excessive yeah. Oh yeah, being a workaholic. Mormonism, excessive. Yeah. I mean, my husband was definitely excessive a workaholic. Podcasting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. What about Scott? What were you saying about Scott? Oh, he was a workaholic before we left the church. You know, he worked crazy hours and was just always trying to, you know, work super hard, prove his, you know, ability and worth, and you know, and we all do that. You know, we all work hard. I mean, I guess you know. Some of us are lazier than others. Who knows? But, you know, I definitely am a doer. I like to work hard. And, you know, that definitely was part of who I was, you know, and still am. But I've chilled out a little bit. <laughs> so, Is Scott still doing the canoeing, rowboating kind of company? Yeah, kayak. Yes. Kayak. Yes. What a great, yes. tell, plug that company. Let's plug it. Oh, Eddie Line. Eddie Line Kayaks. Yes. We bought the company a couple of years ago and it's doing amazing. And How do you doing- spell it? Uh, e D D Y L I N E. Eddie line.com. Yes. All right. We got to plug Eddie line. Cause that's a healthy, that's a healthy sport. It is absolutely healthy. And we've really, really enjoyed, you know, getting outdoors, uh, you know, replacing, you know, our social activities of drinking and et cetera, with, uh, being outside kayak camping with our kids. It's been amazing. So, um, definitely a healthy, um, almost spiritual, you know, when you're out on the water in a quiet, you know, place, you know, just hearing the water lap up against the rocks or the beach, you see sea life, you know, you're connecting with, you know, the planet, earth, you know, the elements, it's, it's a beautiful experience. So it's definitely been a huge um, part of um, kind of our journey, you know, out of, you know, those very first years of, you know, just kind of wandering around trying to figure out life, you know, and doing it maybe not in the most healthy ways, you know, and we're, we're turning that into something, you know, as, as, as filling those voids, I guess, per se. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Well, Brittany, I just want to thank you and, and thank Scott, you know, vicariously for your willingness to be vulnerable and tell your stories so powerful. So um, I'm sure it's healthy for you, but yeah, it's healthy for us. Yeah. And uh, and I know it's going to save lives and help people. Is there any so. any final words of wisdom <clears throat> you know you want to give? Any truths or testimony, secular or whatever <laughs> that you want to yeah. share before we end? Um, I would just you know, and this is something I said at the end of the podcast I did with Annie Grace. Um, with this naked mind was just, you know, 
be, be the best version of yourself. You know, don't, don't put out there, you know, your happiness. Don't make everything condition, your happiness conditional on other things out there, whether it's booze, you know, sex, you know, social, you know, like placing your happiness outside of yourself. Um, doesn't get you very far. You'll always find you're, you're, you're still seeking and seeking. Um, I would say don't be something you're not, <laughs> you know, don't do things because you think you need to, to fit in, just be yourself and, and enjoy, um, you know, self-discovery along the way. You know, there's a lot of, um, amazingness that happens in, um, uh, exiting, you know, the church and, and, and discovering the world in a new way. And sometimes that means we experiment along the way, but I think, um, definitely, you know, be, be true to yourself, be true to who you are. Um, and if you're not sure who you are, you know, it's figured it, out. It, That's figure one of the out. cool yeah. things. And figure out your purpose, figure out, you know, what, what's driving you. Um, and if you feel like you've lost spirituality, there's a lot of a lot of great resources out there to find it again. So secular Buddhism podcast, Eckhart Tolle. I uh, love Eckhart. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the Tao Te Ching is Tao Te Ching. beautiful. That's oh funny, my gosh. Right? It's, yeah. It's amazing. And um, Byron Katie's book called loving what is um, really made a big impact on me as well. So um, there's a lot of great, great stuff out there to, to kind of rediscover, you know, your, your life purpose, um, where you fit in the world. Um, but yeah, live, live your life, um, fully with integrity and live your truth. I love it. All right, yeah. Brittany, Brittany Holly, Scott Holly, you guys are awesome. We love you guys. Love you too, let's, John. Let's hang out your soon. Family. I hope so. I was in Utah this summer, but I was jam packed. I know too many people there. So yeah, we'll definitely well, try to make it up your way. Maybe I'll come up to Seattle soon. Well, let us know if you're around because we'd love to meet up. Um, thank you. Thank thank you so much, Brittany. Thanks to all our listeners. Yeah. Mormonstories.org. If you uh, are a donator, thank you. If you want to support this programming, please go to mormonstories.org and become a monthly donor. That's how we make this happen. We're a nonprofit and we promise to use any donations for the cause. Um, please share this episode. If you know anyone who's uh, struggling with alcohol use, who's thinking about trying alcohol, who's in the middle of it, yeah. please share this episode wherever you can, far and wide, Facebook, Instagram, yeah. Twitter, please get the word out. Um, again, there's several uh, resources that we've mentioned um, yeah. but the and, naked and please, mind, right? Yeah, this naked mind. And I will just put this out there, you know, along the way I've, I've found that, um, paying it forward, you know, helping, you know, people helped me with my exit of the church. Um, you know, I'm happy to be there as a, as a support or how do people get a hold questions. of you? Brittany? Um, you can, you can message me, um, email me B R I T T H O L L E Y at gmail.com. So Brit Holly I'm, with two yeah. T's, right? H O L L E Y at gmail.com. Yeah. Yep. Or, um, I'm on Facebook. So Brittany Wixom Holly, if you want to get a hold of me or personal message me. So Beautiful. I'm always happy to, to answer questions or just be a, someone to listen. You know, I, I feel, um, that, you know, I benefited so much from, you know, the ex-Mormon community or the faith transition community, um, leaving that. And I've benefited from, you know, uh, people who are further ahead of me in recovery from alcohol. So, um, you know, I think it's, you know, a part of the healing process is to share and um, connect. So, yeah. All right, Brittany, thanks so much. You're awesome.